Hey, Resonate. Uh, my name is Josh. It's good to be with you today. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to week three of the sermon series called Fight for Your Life. Uh, if you have your Bible, grab it. You can turn to James chapter one. We will be there in just a moment. Uh, as we get going, I have a question for you. and I want you to participate, like raise a hand, uh, put up a finger or something. Let me know uh, the answer to this question. So how many of you have ever trained for something? 5K, Tough Mudder, Triathlon, Bike Race, Bloomsday, anything. Show of hands. Have you trained for something? Great. Uh, okay, well, then you know how this works. Training is uh, designed to be, uh, there's, there's a goal date, and you pick, you kind of reverse engineer six months, four months, however long you need, and then you go through a process of uh, working out, running, whatever you need to do to get ready for that race day. And if you've done that, then you know that, that physical, uh, the work you do physically is not the only part of the training. You've, you run into this mental component. Uh, about eight years ago, I ran uh, a marathon. And I think the rule is if you run a marathon, you can talk about it three times in your preaching. So this is the third time I'm going to mention that I ran a marathon, which means I can never mention it again. So this is my last one. So I did that. I ran a marathon. Uh, I experienced the agony of training in Pullman, Washington, where it snows and it's uphill both ways and there's wind like crazy, training for six months. Then I drove to Seattle, paid $100 to run for four hours. That, that's what I signed up for. Uh, but what I learned something in this process, I learned that in, in that sense of that kind of that length of running, uh, man, it's like 10% body and 90% brain. Uh, the mental toughness necessary threw me off, like to keep showing up, to keep grinding day after day. Uh, the grit necessary uh, was wild and it was unexpected. So when I meet someone that says they've run a marathon, my first thought isn't, wow, you're in shape. My first thought is, man, you are mentally tough. I'm impressed. You know how to suffer. You know how to show up. You have grit. Uh, I'm fascinated by mental toughness. I'm the guy that goes on Netflix and watches the Navy SEALs training videos where they talk about how they go through uh, boot camp and how guys quit. And I remember watching one of these uh, recently and they're following the sergeant, like this documentary is following the sergeant. And he looked to the camera in this scene where like all the, the SEALs are about to quit and they're like crawling through water. And he kind of says this, uh, whispers this. He says, before people come to training, they all they all work on their body. He's like, but none of them work on their mind. Like none of them show up mentally tough. And so listen, as a series, our, our church, uh, our goal for this series was birthed out of the frustration that many of us are losing ground in our mind. And if we don't fight back in this season, we're going to gravitate away from God's plan and away from God's purpose. So uh, we've tried to be as practical as possible, giving you fight plans. So on week one, we talked about your mind. Uh, last week, Keith talked about community and, and avoiding isolation. And this week, I want to focus again. I want to go back to the mind to help us uh, process temptation. So uh, why, why is that the, the strategy? Well, in order to get to your body, you have to go through your mind. In order to get to your actions, you've got to go through your attention and your affection. Uh, and, and I'm going to say this uh, kind of as we get going. And I don't, know, I don't know if this is obvious to you, but I think it's worth sharing uh, for many of us, we're tempted to believe the lie that Christianity somehow just makes our life better and makes our life easier and everything's going to be a blessing uh, and it's just going to get better. And I've had guys come to me actually and say this like, hey, I'm struggling with this issue or this temptation and I've asked God to take it away, but God hasn't taken away. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God treating me this way? Um, listen, the, the design in, in the scriptures and the design of the Christian life is that God doesn't take stuff away for us. God invites us to engage those things and fight back. Uh, why are we being asked to fight back? And, and again, this may be very obvious to you, but I want to say these as like foundational things as we get going. Uh, we're, being, we're being asked to fight back because sin is no small thing. It is not friendly to us. It is not an ally of ours. It is not something we should be toying around with. There is no such thing as a little white lie and no such thing as a small sin. Sin is powerful. It's deadly. It used to hold us captive and keep us dead. And the Bible uses violent language when it references how God deals with sin and how we are to respond and deal with sin and how God had to send his son to purchase us rescue us away from the power of sin and the enemy. Uh, so I want to show you this before we get to James chapter 1, that even the incarnation, the terminology of Jesus coming to earth isn't some sweet story. It's a, it's a picture of an invasion. 
that Jesus is showing up in enemy territory to win back something that is rightfully his. And the first place you see this is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So I'm going to read some verses to you about the, the, the posture God has towards sin. So in Genesis 3, 15, it says this, The sun will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. That's, that's God talking to the serpent, the enemy, the devil, saying there's coming a day when the sun is going to come and he's going to crush your head. And when that fight's over, you're going to be like, oh, I touched his heel. Well, your head's going to be missing. So you're going to get destroyed. Uh, later in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. He didn't show up to make a deal. He didn't show up to just do this or that. He showed up to destroy, to crush the head. And Jesus' first sermon in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he's anointed me, he's he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that the captives will be set, will be released. Who's the captives? Us. That the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. That this is this is war terminology. I am here to win back something. I am here to overcome those that are powerful and holding you down. Uh, This is battle terminology. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says it in the most explicit terms: put to death. Everything of this earthly nature. What's of this earthly nature? Sin, the flesh, the thing that's keeping you from right relationship with God. Put it to death. There's a great, great quote uh, that says, uh, you kill sin or sin kills you. You choose. You kill sin or sin kills you. Uh, it goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to kind of continue this, this metaphor. And it says this in verse 25. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. A boxer beating the air. No, strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified for the prize. So listen, this is blood, sweat, and tears Christianity. This is active and assertive Christianity against sin. Why is this a story? Well, it's the story uh, because Jesus didn't save us from the fight. He saved us for the fight. That, that's the idea. That he didn't save us so that we could get whisked away to heaven. No, he saved us so that we would have the weapons and the endurance and the ability to fight back against sin. You used to be dead and you couldn't fight. Dead people can't fight, but you're alive now. You can battle. Entering into the kingdom of God is entering into battle. Do you feel that? Do you get that? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 goes on to say, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Aggressive terminology. I don't know if you've seen the Discovery Channel, but when you watch a, a lion prowling around, you're not excited about that. You know someone's about to die. Something's about to go bad. I don't know if you're a hiker and you've ever been in the woods and heard a sound in the darkness and you look and see glowing eyes. Nobody wants that scenario. That is incredibly scary and terrifying. And that is the picture that Peter says. It's like that, prowling around, trying to devour you. So stay alert, stay prepared, stay ready. And so that's the idea of this series is we're trying to help you be alert and be ready and to fight back. And so how how do we fight? As simple as I can say, this is how we fight. And James chapter one is going to help us. But we need to learn the enemy's moves and respond with counter moves. We need to learn the enemy's strategy against us, understand how he works, and respond with counter moves. And James chapter 1 is going to help us do that. So starting in verse 12, I know I've read a lot of scripture, but this is, this is the plan. This is where it really lands for us today, and it's going to help us understand what God's design is. Verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, for he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully fully grown, gives birth to death. So how fighting for your life plays out in the real world is through battles with temptation. That is where the fight is. The enemy is tempting you to do this or that or to believe this or that. And that is the arena in which you battle for your life. And so there's a couple things that the scripture lays out for us that I want us to walk through. 
Uh, number one was, was right out of the gate, you saw this. The Christian life is filled with tests and trials, but you are to remain steadfast under them. That's verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So, so what's, what's the Holy Spirit saying to us? You should not be surprised when you are tempted. You should not be surprised when there are trials. You should not get discouraged when you're being attacked. You should anticipate it. You should expect it. You should be sober-minded. You should be ready for that because no one gets a pass. There is not a day that goes by. There is not an hour that goes by that you are not being tempted by the enemy. Your life is filled with trial, filled with test. You have been given. The, the scripture is clear. You have been given uh, a command that in the midst of all that, what do you do? You remain steadfast. You stand the test. You stay the course. What, what does this mean? It means that you're unwavering in your relationship with God, your commitment to God's truth. It means that you're resolute in your life. It means you're firm in your convictions. It means you're anchored. It, it means you're tethered. It means you're not moving. And so, yeah, your life is full of trials. Yeah, things are coming at you that are difficult and not fair and not fun. But you stay the course. That's the command. That is, is the ask on us that we would remain steadfast under trial. And, and then theologically, it helps us understand something in the second point, that God is not tempting you, but God is allowing you to be tempted. This, this is significant. Let no one say I'm being tempted by God because God cannot be tempted with evil, but, and he himself, himself tempts no one, but God is allowing you to be tempted. So the, this is how I picture it in my mind. It's like every time a temptation comes up, it's almost like it's a crossroad. And, and a lot of people, when they're tempted, they choose to blame God for this temptation or what's going on, or they feel victimized. And, and that's just what the enemy is doing to a lot of them. And so every time you're being tempted, there's a crossroad for you to either blame God or for you to trust God and say, God, I'm being tempted by this. I, I feel this draw in me. I'm, I'm, the flesh inside of me wants this thing. And so for us to fight back, we have to say to ourselves, I'm not going to take the easy path of just blaming God. I'm going to take the harder path, which is trusting God. Because listen, Jesus took responsibility for our sin. And now we're being asked to take responsibility for our sin as well. Take responsibility for that temptation and trust God and fight back. And so those, those are the foundational things that the scripture says really clearly. Uh, but it goes down further. And this is, this is where we're going to land and where things get really practical. Uh, the third thing this text teaches is, that the enemy knows your desires and uses them to entice you. This is verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. The enemy knows you. He knows your Enneagram number. He knows your Myers-Briggs. He knows what Harry Potter house you would be in, whatever your thing is. He knows your wiring. He knows your tendencies. He knows your affections. He knows your vulnerabilities. And he is designing a scheme to exploit you and to attack you where you are weak and to pursue attacking you where you are vulnerable. The enemy knows that there are things inside of you that aren't yet completely mature in Christ, that aren't yet completely healed from the stuff of your past. And those sinful desires are being drawn out and he's trying to allure you. And he uses all of your story against you. And he starts with your mind. He goes after your attention. And so to say it another way, the enemy knows how to make sin look attractive. He knows. He's very gifted at that. And he perfectly works and designs and schemes in such a way where he can, he can lure you and he can draw you. Uh, I've been recently watching on Netflix the, the Social Dilemma documentary. And there's this, this story within the story in, in the documentary about basically picturing us being an avatar. And there's like these three people designing social media in such a way that we are being drawn in to, to, to their schemes. And in the story, there's a, a high school kid that tries to give up his phone for one week, just wants to give up his phone for a week. And if he does it, his mom's going to pay for a new screen. And so a couple of days go by and the, the little guys in his, in his mind, the guys that scheme to try to get him to look at the phone, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of going crazy because they're like, man, he's given up. He doesn't look at his phone anymore. And so they're scheming and devising a plan. And they're like, we're going to show, we're going we're gonna to send a notification that his ex-girlfriend has a new boyfriend, has a new photo. And, and what, what, what that did in that movie, as I was uh, preparing for the sermon, I was like, 
that, that's what it feels like to try to follow Jesus when you're actively being schemed against. Actively, the enemy is working in such a way that goes, if you have a couple of days of freedom, if two days go by and you seem to be walking away from that thing, just prepare for the onslaught for the schemes to come your way. It's, it's the picture of a fishing pole that he knows what bait to use on you. It's not universal bait. Everyone's going to have different bait. It's personalized and he's throwing it and he's casting it and he's trying to get you to bite on. But what you never see is that there's a hook inside of that bait and it hooks you and it hurts you and the enemy solicits things to you. And that's what the scripture is saying, that your mind is lured and your heart is enticed. Your mind is lured and your heart is enticed. Now, there's a pastor in Washington, D.C. Uh, named Ben Stewart, and he's written uh, quite a bit and, and taught quite a bit on relationships and how dating should work and how engagement should work and how marriage should work. He's been incredibly helpful to me. And there's been teaching where he uses this James 1 uh, picture to talk about relationships and how we're, our mind is being used against us. And he said, this is how it works. Uh, and he says, so if you're a girl, the thought is solicited to your mind. I'm single. That's the thought solicited to your mind. I'm single. And you think to yourself, yeah, that's true. I am single. And then that mind, it leaves your mind and it moves to your heart. And then all of a sudden your affections are stirred. And he said, then you go on campus and everywhere you look, everyone is dating. The animals are walking two by two. Your affections are all of a sudden involved and you're hooked. And now some guy shows you attention who is morally beneath you, who never has shown any allegiance to Jesus. But because your mind has started to get, get lured by this thought of being single, you find yourself in a relationship with someone you never should have been in. How did that start? Your mind was enticed. There was a, there was a thought that sent to your mind and you didn't know what to do with it. So you find yourself in a life you never wanted. And then Ben Stewart goes on to say, when it comes to guys, there's a, there's a thought that comes to your mind that says, guys, you should think about naked things. And then all of a sudden a guy is on a track he should have never been on because just he has no way to willfully fight off the thought. You should think about naked things. And so then Ben Stewart says this. He says, what you think about is what you care about. And what you care about is what you chase. What you think about is what you care about. And what you care about is what you chase. And so this is, all of a sudden, this is no small thing. All of a sudden, this is a matter of life and death. All of a sudden, this is a matter of your purpose and God's design for you or a life that completely leads to sabotage. What you think about is what you care about. And what you care about is what you chase. And so listen, Resonate Church, what do you, what do you entertain in your mind? Because this is no small thing. What do you entertain in your mind? Because listen, as clear as I can say it to you, you can't have a free life and an enslaved mind. You can't. You can't live in freedom in, in your actions, in your world, and walk in, in spiritual freedom and have a mind that is enslaved. So listen, you have a choice right now. All of us in the church have a choice to, to think about where it is that our mind is enslaved and the thoughts are being solicited to us because we've, we've got to, to own this and take responsibility for this. We can't think that this sermon's for someone else or you can't wait to share these notes with your spouse. Like this is all of us. Let's all be humble enough to recognize we are being solicited to. We are being lured. It's happening right now. And our response is that we've got to become a student of ourself. We have to know what we believe about doctrine about our life and we have to know the places in our in our heart that aren't safe because the the scripture goes on and it says pretty scary things it says if you if you unite yourself with that desire it gives birth to sin and if you unite yourself with that sin it gives birth to death this is verse 15 then desire when it's fully conceived gives birth to sin and that sin when it's fully grown gives birth to death James uses pregnancy terminology to say if you keep living in that you're going to produce something called death. That, that's how aggressive the terminology is. That If you don't do something with that thought that was solicited to your mind and you allow that sin to manifest and you start to engage with that sin actively, often, the next thing you know, you are dead. <laughs> Pay attention, James is saying. So listen, do you, do you keep yourself from uniting with those desires? Are you fighting to unite with those desires so that you don't end up in death? And so, again, we, we want to offer you as practical as we can a fight plan. And so here are three things that we think you can do to fight back against this progression that the enemy is actively trying to get you to fall into. So number one, fight plan, step one. 
investigate your temptations. Investigate your temptations. If you struggle with comparison, if you have a temptation to compare yourself to others, don't just say, I need to stop comparing myself to others. No, no, no. Investigate that thing. If you have a temptation with anger, which I have a temptation all the time to, to speak death instead of speaking life, to be harsh instead of being kind, to escalate an argument instead of de-escalate an argument. I have all of those temptations. I don't need to just tell myself, stop. I need to investigate and see what's going on. You have got to become Sherlock Holmes or CSI or Jake Peralta or whatever investigative person you can think of. You need to investigate your sin because that's the only way you're going to find out what's really going on. Uh, I read a book a couple years ago called Unwanted by an author named Jay Stringer. Uh, and he, he said something I'd really never heard before. He, sa he said, your brokenness, that, that sin that you struggle with, that is the very place that will reveal the pathway to your healing. But so often in the church, we say, run from that brokenness, flee from that sin, never think about that thing again. If you look at porn, don't, don't think about that. If you have comparison issues, run away from that. If you have money stuff and you shop to, to cope with your life, just stop shopping. Stop, 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 stop. And none of that works. And it leads to a ton of shame. And Jay Stringer said, in a, in a healthy, spirit-led way, investigate your sin. Investigate what's going on. Don't run from your temptation. Peel back the layers and see, why am I vulnerable in this place? Why am I exposed in this place? What lie am I believing about my identity in Christ that is making me so tempted by this? What is going on in my heart? Investigate your temptations. Maybe you need friends to help you investigate that. Maybe it seems unsafe to investigate that, but you've got to drill down into the thing that you're being tempted by and stop running from it and just saying, stop, because it's not going to work. It hasn't worked for me, and I don't think it's worked for you. I think you've tried to stop, and then you find yourself doing it again and again, and you're just in a cycle of shame. Instead, get some friends, get a magnifying glass, and do an autopsy and go, what is going on in this space? How do I get victory from this thing? So number one, investigate your temptation. Number two, Eliminate the moment of temptation. I think many of us know there's a domino effect. Uh, maybe it looks like, hey, you're single and you're, that's your thought and that leads to a crazy amount of decisions that you never wanted. Maybe someone says something in a meeting and it triggers you and leads to a lot of things you never wanted. Maybe you get advertised to and it leads to things you didn't want. There's a lot of things happening that the enemy's throwing at you. But can you eliminate the moment of temptation? So can, can you take a moment and just say like, if, if you look at things you shouldn't on the internet, can you find yourself in a place where you eliminate the moment? And you go, when, when do I look at things I shouldn't? Where do I look at things I shouldn't? Well, usually it's, night, it's at night and I'm tired and I've had a long day and I'm scrolling on my phone. And you go, okay, hey, maybe you shouldn't lay down at night with the World Wide Web right next to your face. How about that? And it, it'd be like an alcoholic pouring a glass of scotch and putting it on the nightstand and saying, don't think about the scotch, don't think about the scotch. Eliminate the moment. There's nothing wrong with watching movies with your boyfriend or girlfriend, but maybe like don't watch them in that space with the lights off and the covers on. Like eliminate the moment of your temptation. If shopping is your thing, if, if comparison is your thing, whatever your thing is, like where is the first domino that kicks into this process that leads you to a life you don't want? Figure that out and eliminate it. Because here, here's what's happening. Uh, the enemy in these moments, he... He always solicits pleasure to you. He never solicits the shame that follows. But that's what happens. He solicits the pleasure. And that's why it's called a temptation. That's why chocolate is called temptation. That's why hot tamales are so tempting. Like there's pleasure involved in that. But, but the, the fact is you never see the shame on the other side. And so can we investigate that and can we eliminate the moment? And then third, and this is the most important one, uh, preach the gospel to your temptation. This is what James does. In verse 16, James preaches the gospel uh, in, in this text. He says this. He says, don't be deceived, my, my, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. What's he talking about? He was just talking about temptation. He was talking about all these things we struggle with. And he says, don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It's coming down from the Father of, life, from, of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to 
to, to change. What, what's James saying? Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else is good enough. Nothing will be enough. Always turn back to the one who is a good gift giver. Always turn back to a good father who is perfect and is lavishing his love on you. Always turn back to the source of joy and stop settling for mediocre alternatives that only leave you frustrated and ashamed. So listen, the deception, the deception that gives power to temptation is the unbelief that God is not a good father who can take care of you. The deception that gives power to temptation is the unbelief that you do not serve a good father who is capable of satisfying you in every way. And I know we talk about this all the time. And I know we say you've got to understand your identity. But listen, you are a son or a daughter of a gloriously good God who loves you and is well pleased with you and can take care of you better than that temptation can. And we have to believe that. We have to believe that. And we've got to walk in that. You know, the temptation of Jesus uh, in, in the Bible where he goes in the wilderness, it happened right after his baptism, right after he's baptized. He goes to the Jordan River. His cousin, John, puts him in the water, brings him out. And what happens there? If, if you have church background, you know this. A voice from heaven says, this is my son who I love and I'm well pleased with. The Holy Spirit's there. It's this whole Trinitarian moment. He's immediately sent into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. And the enemy offers him all kinds of of deception, all kinds of power, all kinds of things that, that, that would have seemed appealing. But Jesus walked into the wilderness with what? With the loudest voice in his head being the voice of the Father. I love you. You're my son. I'm well pleased with you. And I think we've got to go back to the source of our identity. That's what James is saying. You have a good father. And all the perfect gifts are coming from above. And so listen, when it comes to following Jesus, uh, we live in Pullman, and so uh, Mike Leach used to be in Pullman with the air raid offense, and now he's in the SEC, and apparently the air raid still works there. But listen, that same thing applies. When it comes to following Jesus, the best defense is a great offense. Like, score 60 points a game in football, you're going to be fine most of the time. And so, so many of us, we, we're focused on just defending against the enemy and fighting off the temptations instead of finding ourselves just overwhelmingly in love with Jesus and intimately walking with Jesus and being satisfied in Jesus and trusting our identity in Jesus. So when the enemy comes, we're not even that tempted because we have a great offense. So we don't need a lot of defense because we have a great offense. And listen, I know that's simple to say and it's much harder to be applied, but you preach the gospel to your temptations. And when that temptation comes, you say, I am a child of God. I have all I need in Christ. He has given me every good gift. I have a good father. And you just preach to yourself and to your temptation, the gospel. And you put your attention on Christ and, and, and do the things that stir your affection for Christ and watch your affections become more like Christ. And then you will see that those temptations start to lose their, their joy. They start to lose their shine and you start to not even want them anymore. And that is a fun place to be that when your desires look like Jesus's desires. So often in the church, we, we, we want people just to act like Jesus. But the end game is to desire like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to pray like Jesus, to think like like Jesus, that's the goal of discipleship, to want what Jesus wants. And so holiness is the aim. And that, that's, that's a tough aim, but that's the design. And so how's your offense? Are, are you engaging God in a way that these temptations have to, have to come a lot further towards you because you're so wrapped up in Christ? You, you need a good defense, and we've talked about that in the fight plan, but I, I want to make sure you know that a, a good offense is, is the best way to move forward. So this is, this is the picture that God gives us. And I hope that we would be the kind of people that would recognize that the struggle that you are in is evidence that you are alive. It's evidence that you're alive. So be assured that there will always be struggle. It's, it's evidence that you're alive. And God's grace to you is not an excuse for you to stay in your sin. No, it's an invitation for you to fight out of your sin. That's what James is saying and that's what we're hoping for. So, so our, our prayer for you as a church is that you would embrace the battle against sin as a blessing that was given to you in your salvation. You would embrace the battle against sin and you wouldn't give up and you would stay steadfast and you would hold on in the middle of the trials and the whole time you would be thinking, I'm alive. I can fight because I'm alive. 
This is the blessing of my salvation. I used to be dead. I couldn't even fight sin. I was dead, but now I'm alive and I can fight back and I can figure this out. And by God's grace, we'll be transformed to a place. And this is, this is, the, this is the end game for all of us is that we want to do what we ought to do. <laughs> that our desires are so changed. That Christ is so Lord over our hearts. We want to do what we ought to do. And so the enemy's tactics don't work as well anymore because we become more transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So Resonate Church, can you fight this week? Can you investigate your temptations? Look into it. Be honest with yourselves. Can you eliminate the moment when the dominoes start to fall forward? And can you preach the gospel to your temptations? Knowing and believing that God is with you and he's the only one that satisfies. So let's pray that we'd be that kind of church. Let's pray together now. Father, thank you so much for the gift of the gospel, the gift that saved us and brought us to life. And God, now we can fight. Now we can push back darkness. Now we can contend. And God, we, we, we don't take that lightly. So Lord, for some of us who are absolutely enslaved to sin, God, would you, would you help us be set free? And for all of us who need to fight back more against our temptation, God, would you give us courage to fight back? And Lord, I pray that over the course of this week, there would be, there would be ground taken for your kingdom, ground taken, uh, taken back from the enemy. And God, you would help us be men and women who fight temptation this week. I pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.